Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and I'm Helena Wilkinson, an audit partner and advisor at Price Bailey. And I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about tax, um, particularly gift aid, a little bit of update on VAT, talk to you about making tax digital and grants versus contracts. So it is pretty VAT heavy, I'm afraid, for, the, for an afternoon. <laughs> Why am I talking about gift aid from trading subsidiaries? In December last year, as a Christmas present, the FRC issued the updated FRS 102. Um, and in that, there was a clarification that said that you couldn't accrue gift aid unless you had a legal obligation. And it defined a legal obligation as a deed of covenant. And if you didn't have a deed of covenant, you couldn't accrue the gift aid in the year that it was given because the, the FRC was saying that it is a distribution like dividends. And if you recall, you only accrue dividends when you pay them, um, and not the finals, just the interims in the year. And the finals go the following year. So why am I talking to you about that from a tax perspective? Well, if you did make a gift aid payment, I've had so many clients say to me, well, what happens with the tax? This is just an accounting issue. It has no consequences on your tax returns, the tax status of the gift aid payments. It doesn't affect the fact that you can make that gift aid still within nine months of the year end and claim full tax relief in the trading subsidiary and it doesn't pay any tax. So the tax side of things is not changed at all. It's just your accounts are going to look strange unless you get that deed of covenant in place. Um, one slight thing that they allowed was that you can accrue and adopt FRS 102 early for the tax consequences of the gift aid payment. So you can ignore deferred tax, for those of you that are really hot on this, because if you weren't accruing the gift aid, that means you're going to have a profit. You won't have to put the tax on that profit if you can say we are going to make the gift aid payment. So it's a bit strange that you can have the tax benefit without the payment in the accounts, but that's just to warn you that that's coming. So um, many of you may have already been through that process or in, the, in going through that process at the moment. Um, so just to let you know that from a tax perspective, nothing has changed. So I did say I was going to cover VAT quite heavily, and I was just going to update you on a few VAT cases. I haven't got a lot of time, so I'll just give you the headlines in case you want to go and look them up or take more information on them. The first one is uh, Newcastle Underline College, and this is really just to say that there was a reasonable excuse, because HMRC engaged with this charity for a while, arguing why they couldn't have their appeal, and it went back and forth. They went out of time, and the tribunal found that it, wasn't, it was unfair to not allow them to appeal because they were out of time due to correspondence, so they allowed them. So that's just so showing that sometimes the tribunals are quite nice um, and do allow things that, that you wouldn't expect. Essex International College I've put on here because it's to do with the educational exemption and they were trying to split the supply of the educational materials away from education itself so they could separate the VAT treatments out on both of them. Um, and it was clarified that it is one single supply. They tried three various arguments lost on all of them. Um, and it's very clear if you're an eligible body, the education supply will apply. And dynamic people is just one on partial exemption, which effectively is quite a complex case. So I won't go into a lot of detail, but, uh, but the, 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 the upshot was that effectively, because they changed their group structure and they were taken over by another entity, so they expanded their group, HMRC tried to argue that the, that the partial exemption method needed to be dropped because they changed ownership and structure. And it was clarified that that has nothing to do with joining a VAT group. The partial exemption is a standalone agreement. So the method might be wrong and might need updating for circumstances that have changed in that organization, but it's got nothing to do with joining a VAT group. So that was a clarification on that point. So if any of those are relevant to you, more than happy to talk about them in detail, pick them up afterwards. The one that's more interesting is um, HMRC versus University of Cambridge. This has been going on so long that I've got bored of talking about it, but um, 
it has now gone all the way to the Court of Appeal, so it's gone all the way through the system, and they couldn't make their decision based on the facts. So they have referred it to the European courts. So this is likely to be the last case, possibly, following Brexit. We're thinking this is the last case that the European courts will rule on, and by the time they come back, because it's going to be at least 18 months before they make their minds up, we probably won't have to listen to them anyway, because we'll be out of <laughs> Europe. So I don't know if it was a delaying tactic or not, but it's a really important case for the charity sector, because it allows you to take um, investment manager's fees and have VAT recovered on them, if you can use the argument that the income is part and parcel of the, the total of the charity and it's nothing to do with investments that the investment manager fees are linked to. With, so they're not to be treated as exempt. So it's an absolutely crucial case because if you can delink income and expenditure treatment on certain circumstances, this is really important for the charity sector, which is possibly why they didn't want to make a decision. The spring statement was both quiet from a tax and VAT perspective. I'm hoping that future statements might be a bit more interesting for the charity sector. So it's really very little to say, apart from that they are looking at um, split payments and getting consultation on how that's going to affect VAT. They are threatening to look at the VAT registration threshold. Um, because of my next few slides, you'll understand why I don't think they changed it now, because there would have been uproar. But there is a general consensus and a feeling that that rate, that VAT registration threshold level will come down in the future because we're the highest in Europe. A lot of countries, there are about 30,000 or less. So um, we are expecting that to change. And then if you're traveling in Northern Ireland, there was some uh, uh, VAT and passenger duty affecting Northern Ireland. So really not much to say. And I said that I wanted to talk to you why that VAT threshold would be important. So at this point, I just wanted to ask you all a question, keep you all awake. Do you think that making tax digital affects your organisation? And I wouldn't mind if you just let me have a view now of whether you think it's yes, no, or you really don't know. Okay, in that case, it's very important I talk to you about making tax digital, because a lot of you don't know. Um, I wanted to assess how long to spend on the subject, so you've given me a clear guide here now. What's happened with government is they've seen quite enviously that a lot of Europe have got digital records from um, a lot of their businesses and individuals, and they're quite envious that we still I still, for a long time, was submitting a paper return, which annoyed them immensely, but they couldn't stop me. So what they're trying to do with Making Tax Digital is they believe that if you file things electronically, it will be correct. But we all know, garbage in, garbage out. So I don't know how that's going to reduce their £4 million, four million pound gap, but that's, that's their arguments for Making Tax Digital. It was all meant to start with income tax and corporation tax, but because there was so much pressure and changes that what's happened instead is VAT's come first. VAT was meant to be last. VAT is first. So from April 2019, those of you that didn't know, if you are VAT registered and you have to be VAT registered, i.e. your income is over the VAT registration threshold, you haven't voluntarily VAT registered, you will have to comply with making tax digital from April next year. And it means that you have to submit your VAT returns electronically. And that's not the gateway. I'm putting numbers on the gateway that you go into or can do at the moment. That is what they call API-enabled returns, which effectively is you press a button on your computer system and it transmits your VAT return electronically to HMRC. 
All the deadlines, so how often you have to file, everything else is staying the same at the moment. They were going to reduce the deadlines because they said it should be quicker for you to be able to press the button, but they haven't yet. But that is quite a big issue. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more. They've started a pilot in April, so they've already started to get businesses trying to submit their VAT returns electronically. So they are also getting their software ready to collect all this data from you because they're not ready yet either um, and they've got a website and a hub for software developments to try and encourage them to be ready for you because they are not going to give you a solution on this one you have to go to your accounting software developer or and get them to confirm they're going to make your software compliant or you have to go and find someone that will what we've been hearing is things like Sage and QuickBooks, they're only going to allow their cloud version to be API enabled, so desktops won't work anymore. So there is quite a lot of thought that needs to go into this and to be aware of the changes that are coming. Um, and some software de developers and software suppliers don't even seem to be doing anything at all yet. So I don't know what software you use, but you do need to be aware of it. Um, there is also the issues as to what's going to happen with the penalties and the regime in terms of submitting things late. Well, they're pretty confident that people aren't going to have this right by April next year. So they're doing what's called a soft landing, which is really unusual, but they're so keen to bring it in in April and to just go with it that they are bringing in this soft landing. And what that means is you won't be fined for filing your digital VAT return late or for not keeping adequate digital records. So for a year, you, that doesn't mean you can't do your VAT returns and just ignore that because you'll get fine, fine for getting it wrong. You just won't get fined for doing it late or not having the proper records. And the proper records are implying that everything behind that pressing that button is also digital. So everything that relates to your VAT is digitally stored. Um, so we've got quite a lot of clients that are struggling with things like conference income software that's separate and they book it all through that and they post a monthly journal. That's not a digital record. So you need to start to think about do your softwares talk to each other and start to think about the consequences of this. They've not really given many answers as to how they're going to deal with that problem and how they're going to help organisations. So it is just be aware that this is just working its way through and there's going to be more questions than answers, but at some point, in theory, you need to have the whole thing digitally. Um, the only good thing is partial exemption. They acknowledge that nobody, including them, I think, understands it. So how can they get software developers to create software that can create a partial exemption calculation? And as a result of that, that is being exempted from the digital at this stage. So you can download your information into a spreadsheet, do your, do your calculations, make all your errors, post your journal, and that will be fine. And, that's, um, and that journal doesn't have to be electronic. You can just manually post that journal and then upload your digital uh, that return. So that's the good news for charities because that bit is the nightmare um, and at some point that will be removed when software developers get their head around partial exemption or we get a simplification of the method, um, hopefully the latter. For your information, I'm not intending to take this, uh, to go through this, this is what you're supposed to keep on a digital record. They have clarified um, on that bottom box over there that this is going to be amended either in guidance or um, in legislation because they've realised that what they're asking for there in char for charities would, f would be for you to do your partial exemption on an invoice by invoice basis and they didn't mean that. So that don't take that to mean partial exemption, that's just your normal boxes where you go residual, exempt, etc. That's all you need to do with your purchases. You don't need to do anything more at this stage and they will correct. This is a HMRC slide. 
So I'm just going to touch on Brexit because there are some consequences uh, from a VAT perspective with Brexit looming. Um, there was this big crash waiting to happen because effectively we were going to leave Europe on the 29th of March, no longer be able to have all of the European laws and reverse charging and everything else that we do with Europe and then have to submit your VAT return electronically in April without having a clue what the VAT position was. So there is a draft at the moment, which still is a draft and hasn't been approved, but if that draft goes as it was, then there's going to be effectively no change to VAT and the way that you deal with VAT until the 31st of December 2020 with regards to European supplies. So that was the saving grace that was the only thing they could do to make making tax digital work. So although we leave on the 29th of March, you ignore it for that purpose and carry on as if we were still in, as long as that agreement gets signed up and uh, agreed to, which everyone is hoping in the VAT world will happen. One other thing that I wanted to touch on, which is causing a bit of controversy in the sector, is uh, zero rating of charity advertising online. So things like Facebook, um, we all know that when you've put adverts in some of your journals and, and other publications that are specific, you can still get the zero rating because although it's a targeted audience, it's accepted, you can do that and it's not viewed as targeting. However, they um, are saying that for uh, social media, they're not accepting that and they are seeing that the screening that you do on social media does mean you're not advertising to the public. Um, and therefore, you are effectively advertising, which is outside of the zero rate exemption. So we have had quite a few cases and we're aware of issues with the advertisers issuing VAT invoices now and backdating them to clients. Um, and this is one that CTG, the Charity DAX Group, is trying to fight for the charity sector, but we're not seeing that they're going to allow this one. So it's just be aware that there is this big issue at the moment with any online advertising, you might have a problem with VAT to come. And of course, if it is Facebook, that's your, your, yeah, it's your reverse charge um, situation, which makes it even worse because it might not be recoverable then. And finally, um, I know some organisations do get grants and contracts, and just to remind you that the, the general rule is a contract is, a, a, well, they don't use the word contracts, they call it a supply, a consideration for a supply, and then effectively a consideration for a supply is vatable, usually unless it falls into one of the exemptions, and a grant is a donation, so it isn't. And there's always been this controversy about where those fall and what's the distinction between one and another. Restricted grants have sort of shifted that grey area more towards them being contracts. So they've issued a massive piece of guidance, including the working guidance for HMRC that goes through cases and cases and cases and explains why they were vatable or not. So if you do have any sorts of grants or contracts and you're, you're not absolutely clear and you've not had that advice or you're not sure, you need to be careful because quite often when we win quite a lot of new clients and the area that we see the most common mistakes is on this point. And if it wasn't a grant and it was a contract, it can cost a lot of money and we've had to try and negotiate large sums down for clients that would have just gone out of business if HMRC hadn't been nice to them. So do please look at this guidance. I'm not intending to go through it, but the next two slides um, are giving you what the key factors are for a grant, so things like freely given, and that there's no legal address or clawback, and then things that are given for a contract, which is the converse of that, that obviously there is legal address if things go wrong, that you are supplying a service. So they're the bullets that, that are the general bullets that HMRC have come up with to try and help you differentiate between one or the other. So my final touching, my final point for you is just be careful on your accounts because therefore the accounting trick, I know I'm not 
meant to be doing accounts, but I just have to because I'm an auditor. Um, the, the general view is that donations is where grants go because that's where donations, it's, it was going to say donations, grants and legacies, but they reduced it to donations and legacies. And contracts tends to go as charitable activity or other fundraising, etc. So when you're doing your analysis of your account, do be careful where you put these because one of the, the bullets on the previous slide said they will look at your accounting treatment to determine whether you thought it was a grant or a contract as, that, as an indicator. So that was my final warning, is just be a little bit careful with your accounts. Well, thank you, Helen. If you stay there for a second for any questions, anyone with a nice complicated question would be particularly <laughs> welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a really simple, oh yeah, great. I'd just like to ask, um, do you want to wait for the mic, yeah. Simon? So. <laughs> Simon Ross from Manchester University Press. So um, your talk was surprisingly valuable to me. Um, we've, um, we've gone from a situation of having 100% uh, of our VA recoverable to maybe two thirds or more being not recoverable. So this hurts. This hurts in a financial year in which it changes and it hurts um, moving forward. So um, the, your, uh, the, I think it was the Essex International College thing is that's the trap we've fallen into. And it's got to do with the way in which we trade with our mother home university. So it's, it's a very real problem for us. Um, the question I had, though, was um, I, I don't know if you're aware that the, there's lots of V8 issues in the publishing world. Mm -hmm. Um, one of them is that uh, print books um, are VAT exempt and mm -hmm. e-books aren't. Do you, do you see... Zero rated. Right zero right. rated. Uh, do you see that the, there will be... I mean, I think the publishing industry would obviously like e-books to be zero rated, but it's my view is it's more likely they'll be that of you. They'll, they'll attract the same as print books. Do you have a view? Is there a feeling about that? There was a case, a European case, whose name escapes me. Um, if you drop me a card, I can let you okay. have the details. But there was a case that went through that, that was in favour and supported that they were zero rated. Uh, the UK have chosen to ignore them because they don't have to follow that, that view. Um, and the, that argument just goes round and round the houses. I'm not convinced personally that everything we've heard, that there's going to be any change in the VAT rules for a while. I think the only thing that's going to happen is they're going to probably bring that threshold down and more businesses will fall into making tax digital going forwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I'm not convinced yeah. they're going to tackle VAT uh, anytime soon because yeah. the next two years is just going to be Brexit. They've got no time for anything else. And then once we come out of that, what, what are we going to face? Are we yeah. going to start with VAT issues at Parliament or... Um, will we be looking at the economy and growth and yeah, I other think, aspects I think of business? Yeah, I think post-Brexit, I think putting VATs on, on uh, print books is an easy win, easy revenue generator. But anyway, that's just my view. But my last just question, what, what is the winning the case for Cambridge University? What's it worth? To Cambridge University, it's worth a lot. And if you're actually in that position, you can put a claim in now and they will pay it out. They will, send, they will pay it and they will send you a letter to say that if that goes wrong, they'll be writing to you to ask you for the money back. Um, <laughs> but they will honour the claims at the moment because I don't think they feel in a strong position, having lost all the way up to the Court of um, Appeal. Uh, it's more... Th it, it depends how big your investment manager's fees are to you as an organisation and if there's a lot of fat on them. It's about getting it into your partial exemption pot. So this is then dependent on your partial exemption recovery method. Mm. So it goes in the residual pot. If you're recovering 70%, you get 70% back. If it's five, it's 5%. Five so it's hard to answer that question. Um, but the principle of delinking investment managers' fees from an exempt income supply and having a recovery on them, that principle is far, far more important for the sector because yeah. there's other aspects that could hinge off that. So that's why VAT advisors are very excited about the University of Cambridge and the potential 
that that brings for future claims, for future things that are, and, and delinking things like donations more away from um, subsidised fees, etc. So uh, we've, there's been quite a lot of losses on those arguments, but this could swing things different ways. Okay, thank you. Um, I would just say to you, have you thought about trading subsidiaries and in yeah, your... I'll want to talk to you later if you're, if you're around. <laughs> Very good. Okay, I'll stop the questions now and we'll come back and add some more at the panel time. So thanks again.